Today on Christian World News, death sentence. In Pakistan, a Christian couple is convicted of blaspheming Muhammad. Religious rights advocates say the charges and the trial are a sham. Plus, up from the ashes. 20 years ago, nearly 1 million people died in the Rwandan genocide. Today, the country is seeing an economic and spiritual renewal. And the underground coffee project. See the novel idea that's setting captives free from a life of sin and crime. A Christian man and his wife face death in Pakistan. Hello everyone, I'm George Thomas. And I'm Wendy Griffith. A judge in Pakistan has sentenced a Christian couple to death on false charges of blasphemy. The judge ordered their execution after convicting them for sending a text message critical of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. Gary Lane has details. Scenes like these have become all too familiar in Pakistan. Militant Muslims go on a rampage, ready to beat and kill anyone simply accused of blasphemy against their holy book, faith, or prophet. Such was the response last July, when an imam in the city of Gojra accused Christian Shafkat Emanuel and his wife Shagufta of texting him a blasphemous message against Muhammad. Police arrested and jailed the couple. Keith Davies of the group Rescue Christians says the allegations against the two are bogus. The wife uh, cannot write, she's illiterate. The husband is a cripple from his waist down, can't move. Um, they had a cell phone that they lost and they reported it missing to the, to the owner of the store. The store uh, manager testified in court that it was reported stolen and was reported missing to him. Despite a lack of evidence, Shafkat and his wife were sentenced to death. Davies says Muslim extremists either bribed or intimidated both the prosecutor and judge assigned to the case. We had, had people who had private meetings with the judge uh, who said that, you're crazy, I, I have to convict, I have to sentence to death because otherwise I'll be killed. Sir, like Davies, Jeff, Jeff King, president us. of International Christian Concern, believes the Christian couple will eventually be released. Now the, the couple will sit in prison for the next five to six years until it reaches a high court. They're often released then if they're not killed in prison, though. And in the meantime, what happens with their kids? Have they been without their parents? I, have they even been able to see the parents? No, they cannot see the parents because, uh, because they're also threatened with death because the extremists there want to kill the whole family. And, and the grandfather is not a young man. I'm sure he's concerned about his health and the longevity uh, of his ability to care for these uh, children. Yes, he's 86 years old. So uh, he can't, he, he's not in a, in a position to... to uh, provide aid and, and, uh, and, and to bring these children up. Um, but our organization has the ability to help these children. Pakistani Christians Shafkat and Shagufta are not alone. Others like Asya Bibi still waste away in prison, also accused of blasphemy, also sentenced to death. Cases like this and some others make a lot of, of noise and they get some attention. But the tragedy is there's so many more and they're sitting quietly, no one knows about them. What can be done? Both King and Davies say the U.S. government gives millions of dollars each year to Pakistan. And with that money comes political leverage to gain the release of those like Shafkat and Shagufta. Our goal is to secure their release and uh, we're going to put as much pressure as we possibly can to try and do that. We all know to pray, but at the same time we've got to get on the phone with our legislators and say what is going on. Without political pressure, strong political pressure, from the United States, it's not going to happen. Gary Lane, CBN News. And to see more from Keith Davies and Jeff King, log on to Gary Lane's blog, The Global Lane, at CBNNews.com. From Pakistan to Africa, where deadly fighting between Muslims and Christians in the Central African Republic killed more than 30 people this week. Others are fleeing their homes in an effort to escape the violence. This latest outbreak comes as the United Nations Security Council approved a measure to send nearly 12,000 extra peacekeeping troops to the region. They won't arrive until September, however. Central African Republic has been in chaos since March 2003 when Muslim rebels seized power and launched brutal attacks against Christians. In retaliation, some Christian militia began attacking Muslims. Not all Christians are returning violence for violence. Open Doors USA spoke with one woman who suffered a tragic loss, but she is determined to forgive and love her enemies. Si 
lundi au petit matin que quelqu'un est venu frapper la porte pour me demander de sortir. On avait peur, on était dans la maison. On ne pouvait pas sortir parce qu'il sillonnait. Il sillonnait, il passait de maison en maison. Il cassait les portes, il cassait les fenêtres. Le frère m'a demandé de m'asseoir. Et quand il m'a demandé de m'asseoir, mon cœur a commencé à battre. Et puis il m'a dit, hier quand ils l'ont pris, ils l'ont juste abattu. Ils l'ont mis de, de chez vous ici. Son corps, j'ai encore en terre. Je suis... J'ai crié. Je m'efforce de pardonner euh, à ces hommes tous les, les actes qu'ils ont commis. Le chrétien n'est pas celui-là qui doit utiliser les armes, qui doit tuer son prochain parce que, parce que. Moi, j'ai vécu dans, dans des quartiers musulmans. Je suis avec mon mari, on est très accepté par les musulmans. Mais la situation qui est arrivée, c'est un musulman qui a tué mon mari. Et pour ça, je ne vais pas me lever pour, pour faire du n'importe quoi. Je dois garder le témoignage chrétien. Et je crois fermement que en voulant islamiser les, les chrétiens, ils finiront par devenir chrétiens eux-mêmes si nous les chrétiens, on garde notre témoignage dans le fond de Dieu. We want to hear your thoughts and prayers for the church in Central African Republic. Please post them to our Christian World News Facebook page. Mm. Well, this week marks the 20th anniversary of the genocide in Rwanda. When that tragedy ended, Rwanda's society and its economy was in ruins. But now it's become one of Africa's surprising success stories. And one reason, homegrown entrepreneurs. Our very own Ephraim Graham traveled there and witnessed how Regent University is helping hundreds of Rwandans turn bright ideas into thriving businesses. Rwanda was once called a tropical Switzerland in the heart of Africa. Today, that beauty has returned to the landscape and to the faces in this East African nation. When you look around in town, you can see that uh, the country has a direction. Many credit President Paul Kagame for giving the country that direction. To want a prosperous nation, to want your people to have ownership. It was Kagame and the Rwandan Patriotic Front that led its people out of genocide in 1994. This land of a thousand hills saw nearly a million people killed in just 100 days of ethnic violence. During that time, Serge Kamari returned to Rwanda from Congo and joined the RPF army in fighting. There were so many problems going on. Uh, one time you have uh, one group of people who are, who are killing the others, and you also have another group of people who are uh, working hard to stop the killing and to also bring back so many Rwandans that were living outside of the country. And, and it happened. That's one thing that I'm proud of being Rwandan, that we solved our own problem. Serge is now helping boost his country's growing economy. He owns Jalen's Bakery, a spot for tourists and Rwandan transplants to socialize, satisfy their sweet tooth, and even grab a freshly baked bagel. It's only two and a half months that we're here and it, it, it is a success. Kamari began writing his business plan as a student at Rwanda's Business Development Center, or BDC. It's a hands-on 14-week school created by Regent University Center for Entrepreneurship. It changed what I, I learned or knew about business. And one particular thing I remember is that uh, they taught us to do business not from our head, but from our heart. Serge Kamari is one of 200 entrepreneurs who learned to build a successful business, the Regents Development Center here in Rwanda. And that kind of success has allowed the school to expand its program to Uganda and India. We exist to help transform people and nations using business. Jason Benedict helped to get the center running. The government here in Rwanda threw the door open for us and said, you know, we want to be the first. And so they actually uh, helped make that happen. We are among them the top 
and fastest growing economies in Africa. So, well, and uh, a place where doing business is, is convenient. Jean Bosco Ayachu is the Development Center's CEO. The former banking executive is also a graduate with two successful businesses. Our aim is to make sure that the graduate has a viable and a profitable business. The BDC pairs graduates with mentors from around the world. Jean Bosco sees an even bigger lesson taught by the school. How do you give back to the community? How do you support other individuals to, to reach their full potential? That lesson comes to life back at Jalen's Bakery. The shop is named after Serge's wife, Jennifer Lynn, who came to Rwanda from Canada as a missionary. I remember particularly they said uh, it's good to, to find a business that you, you have the skill or I, you know people you know, who will work with you who have the skill. And I remember that in my own family. I have a wife who's an excellent baker. It was just like, here's a gift from God. So that's how we're treating this place. It's a gift. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're responsible for that. Serge and Jennifer employ 20 people, 17 of them struggling women. They all come from situations where they would not be able to pay the rent, um, put food on the table, pay for school fees for their children. And they earn a small salary here. So they're able to do some of that. We help them out with their medical needs on top of that. As they learn to make cookies, cakes, and cupcakes, Serge and Jennifer work. To get them to dream, to even think that they were created with purpose and that they have a role in the kingdom. And it's not about making money at all. <laughs> this bakery is a mini business development center. Same sort of foundational sort of stuff. They've got to have, you know, in 18 months to two years, they'll have their little feasible business plan. It's going to work. They can go and they can implement their business and we'll help them, you know, do that with whatever, you know, they save some capital, we'll add to it, whatever that looks like. They can start their own entrepreneurial businesses and, um, you know, it's great that they work here. Mm -hmm. I love each one of them, mm -hmm. you know, but um, I want them to move beyond me. It's a concept that can only add to the country's beauty. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Kigali, Rwanda. Thanks, Ephraim. Coming up, after decades of fighting, Muslim rebels sign a peace deal with the government of the Philippines. What does it mean for Christians who spent years living in the line of fire? Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Inside every child is a hero, a leader, a friend to others someone who helps out, who does the right thing, who dreams of what they can be, but they still need our help. What should I do? What should I say? How should I feel? That's where Superbook comes in. It provides moral and spiritual truths through situations children can relate to teaching God's Word to the children you love. Join the Superbook DVD Club and receive Superbook's newest episodes as they're available, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of only $25. Get Superbook today and watch the miracles happen. 
A well-respected Dutch priest has been murdered in the Syrian city of Oms. Father Francis van der Lute lived in Syria for more than 40 years. When the civil war began, the Jesuit priest refused to leave, instead staying in a rebel-held area to continue his work with refugees and civilians. Father uh, van der Lute's murder is highlighting fears among Christians in Syria. They've increasingly become targets as hardline Islamic rebels gain control. Voters are flocking to the polls in the world's largest democracy. They're, they're deciding which party will control their federal government. The opposition BJP party in India may win enough votes to control a coalition government in parliament there. That's causing Christians to be concerned. They're afraid. But then uh, what they're seeing is all what they have achieved all these years is going to be destroyed by a stroke of in many places because of the way, uh, the aggressive way, sometimes the new BJP leadership behaves in this country. As you can imagine, Christians in India are asking for prayers. Mm. Well, for more than 100 years, Islamic rebels in the southern Philippines have waged war with the government. And now, after more than 17 years of negotiations, they have signed a historic peace agreement with a major faction of the rebel coalition. CBN Asia correspondent Lucille, Lucille Talusan has more. The historic peace agreement was signed by members of the Philippine government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, or MILF, which represents the Muslims in the present peace agreement, is the biggest breakaway group of the Moro National Liberation Front, or MNLF. In September of last year, some members of MNLF sieged the southern city of Zamboanga, leaving some 200 dead and displacing thousands of residents. Parmanan Hajul was one of the victims of the war in Zamboanga. Our house was just 100 meters away from the fighting between the MNLF and government soldiers. It was very traumatic for my family, and that is why I'm so happy that the peace agreement was finalized. There are other Muslim rebel groups to reckon with before this peace process can be successfully implemented. But the government, the MILF, and other stakeholders, including the church, are believing that this agreement is the key to a lasting peace and progress in the predominantly Muslim region of Mindanao. Bishop Ephraim Tendero of the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches says Christian involvement for finding peaceful solutions for the decades-old conflict in Mindanao helped end the insurgency that left an estimated 150,000 people dead since 1970. They consulted with us and in that consultation we had a no-holds-barred discussion. There will be freedom of religion, freedom of worship, freedom of expression. Uh, that will be guaranteed. Then the Muslim leader said, can you pray for us? Can you imagine a Muslim leader asking a Christian bishop to pray? The Philippine Congress must approve the peace plan before it can become law. Philippine President Benigno Aquino III fully supports the peace plan and gave a warning to anyone who attempts to derail it. I will not let peace be snatched from my people again. Not now, when we have already undertaken the most difficult and most significant steps to achieve it. Because of the opposition from the different Islamic groups, it may still be a long and tough journey before peace in southern Philippines can finally become a reality. Lucille Talusan, CBN News, Manila. Up next, Transformation, the ministry that uses coffee beans to help drug addicts and criminals start a brand new life. Kids, do you love games? And do you love discovering things? Yeah. Well, do you? Yeah. Then you're gonna love this. It's the new free Superbook Kids Bible app. You can play games, watch videos, find answers to your questions, and a whole lot more. The new Superbook Kids Bible app. Free downloads available on iTunes and Google Play now. CBNnews.com. News you want, when you want, 24-7. Stay current with up-to-the-minute stories. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, New York. I don't have to wait for my news anymore. CBNnews.com, at your fingertips all day long. I only watch the stories I want to see. I find the story, I click on it, and boom, I'm there. Embassy in Washington, Eric Stackelbeck, 
CBN News. The source for your news, cbnnews.com. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Here in America, millions get caught up in drug addiction in the cycle of crime. And those who get sucked in often get stuck there. And prisons have a very poor record of helping these people break free. But one ministry is seeing some remarkable success. Caitlin Burke went to Washington State to bring us this look at something called the Underground Coffee Project. It's morning in the Skagit Valley small town of Burlington. And in the basement of this 100-year-old bank building, the Underground Coffee Project begins another day's work. These men come from a different kind of underground. Gangs, prison, drug addiction. Well, I was a heroin addict and a meth cook and a meth addict and a cocaine addict. And I used all of those on a daily basis. And so for 17 years, uh, I was in agreement with evil. At Underground Coffee, it's about more than just roasting the coffee beans. There's a profound message for the men in how the beans get from this to this. These cold, hard, ugly beans come into the roaster. The heat changes them and changes their character, changes their appearance, changes their aroma and their flavor. And that's exactly what happened with Zach. In time, the fire of the Holy Spirit cracked his shell, transforming this once violent, angry man into a humble servant of God. What is your purpose in life now? Um, to share good news with people who are suffering and to suffer well with others. Like Jesus would go into people's suffering with them and, and even when they're guilty and full of sin, that didn't separate him from them. The Underground Coffee Project is part of Tierra Nueva, a ministry with a heart for people on the margins. And it all began with the beans. Honduras, 1981. Newlyweds Bob and Gracie Ekblad were deeply moved by the poverty there. Most of the people there attributed their poverty to God's will. When we began discipling them in farming practices, and they began to have the same results we did, then suddenly God was sort of off the hook in a sense. And that opened the way for us to talk about God differently. But it became clear the last thing those Honduran peasants wanted was a sermon. In Spanish, a sermon is the same as a, a scolding. Most of the people that we work with assume that a church is really a, a place where you go um, to be reminded of all the things you're not doing. Bob explains in his book, Reading the Bible with the Damned, how he helped them discover for themselves the truth of God's unconditional love. In time, Tierra Nueva, or New Earth, was born. In 1994, Bob and Gracie moved back to Washington. As the county jail's new chaplain, Bob met Julio. Trying to get help before, and it's like, I've always got turned down because of my criminal background and because I was an active gang member. But Bob never looked at me like that. Tierra Nueva always accepted me with open arms. They told me Jesus loved me no matter what. But Julio's shell was especially hard to crack, due in part to his gang ties and hardcore drug addiction. For 18 years, he was in and out of jail. Finally, he had nowhere else to turn. A bounty had been put on his head. Julio was on the run. I was praying and I was asking God, if you could get me out of this one, and I'll, I'll surrender to you. And the first thing that came into my mind was Pastor Robert and Tierra Nueva. He immediately got on a bus and headed back to the Skagit Valley. We baptized him five days after he came. 
we just watched him grow um, into an amazing sort of man of God. And so I guess I really believe in the importance of Pierce perseverance. I didn't feel I was worthy of God's love from all the bad things that I had done in my past. Like, well, how could God want to use me? And I just kept remembering that Pastor Robert said, remember Paul, he was a crucifier of Christians and Jesus used him to, to help people and to reach out to the people. Tierra Nueva strips away the layers of religion, showing what Jesus' ministry was really like. In humility and unconditional love, they bear witness as modern day Saul's are transformed into the image of Christ. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Skagit County, Washington. On, Give me that. <laughs> Bye. Ah, sure, life is busy, but I found a way to make a huge difference in people's lives. I guess you could say I'm changing the world right here from home. I bring medical supplies and doctors to people in need and dig wells so that villagers can have clean and safe water to drink. I make it possible to preach the gospel in over a hundred countries, including right here in America. And when disaster strikes, I'm there, providing food, thank you, and emergency supplies to give people hope again. Every day, CBN and I are making the world a better place. Here you go. My life is hectic, so I join CBN through Pledge Express. My bank does all the work, and I know that my gift is being used where it's needed most. So become a CBN partner and join Pledge Express, because you can do a world of good right from where you are. Hi, good morning. Are you ready to get started? The Bible says that God speaks in the visions of the night. The question for us today is, does God still speak in our dreams? Can God use our dreams to warn us, instruct us, inspire us, call us to pray, and build our faith? In Gordon Robertson's newest DVD teaching, Visions of the Night, you'll discover how God used dreams throughout the Bible, how to know if a dream is from God, what to do when God speaks to you in dreams, and how to understand the plans God has for you. Dreams can tell us what God wants us to do. You can dream of the good works God has created for you and find the satisfaction in life that only He can provide. Get CBN's newest DVD teaching, Visions of the Night. It's our gift to you when you join the 700 Club. Available now. And finally on the broadcast, here's a sight you don't often see. Cell phone video of Christian human shields protecting a church from destruction in eastern China. Members of Sanjiang Church in Wenzhou were joined by neighboring churches this week to prevent government demolition of their building. They sang songs and prayed. Church leaders say Communist Party officials fear the rapid spread of Christianity and, vi and violence in that province. Yeah, mm. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, folks, that's, that's it. That's We're done it. for this we week. We are done. We've been around the world. And we have. It was fun. Encouraging stories. Well, until next week, from all of us here at Christian World News, goodbye and God bless you. <laughs>